few years ago, I heard a story about a woman named Rue. And Rue was decide, had decided to move into what was becoming the very expensive area of Sag Harbor, New York. She was having a hard time finding a house that met her budget, and just when she thought that her luck had been exhausted, she came across what could be described as the deal of a lifetime. But there was a catch. The home that Rue was trying to buy was listed under two different prices. The first price, the higher price, included things that she had expected, quote, a house, a shed, and a little garden. And the second listing of the house, about $110,000 less expensive, included something that surprised her. A house, a shed, a little garden, and Ned. Ned was the former owner of the home, and he was selling the house at a good rate to the person that would allow him an elderly man who was becoming quite ill, to live out his remaining days on the first story of the house, the larger story. And Rue, if she took the deal, could live in the two rooms upstairs until Ned had left. She jokingly referred to him as the man who came with my house. <laughs> so when Rue first bought the house, she said it wasn't a problem for her. She didn't take up a lot of room. She was single. Ned wasn't going to be around for very long. And within a year, she had, required, had acquired a puppy, a husband, and a baby. And Ned was as healthy as he'd ever been. <laughs> so in the radio interview that I heard, Rue said that she was a little ashamed to even talk about this circumstance because all the parties involved knew that at least part of her was a little anxious for, let's say, Ned to leave. I never expected to live this long, said Ned. I'm aware that the other side can't be thrilled I'm still around. I can't help but think that a lot of us have some situations in our life that are similar to Rue's, although maybe not her exact circumstance. It reminds me how difficult it is to live in process, how unavoidable it is. Here's this woman who has the life she'd imagined for herself. And now she's convinced that she can't live that life yet until something or someone changes. Here we are, these finite human beings, the literal cells of our body replacing themselves over the course of years. It's impossible to be the same person. We're changing and growing. We're never finished. Here we are, the only creatures that I know in the whole universe so far that are aware that we're limited, but can see a life beyond our limitations. I'm especially aware of how hard it is to be human on a day like today, on New Year's Day. And it's rare that New Year's Day falls on a Sunday, but I think it's a good thing. Where better than church to come on a day when we're spending so much time reflecting on our lives and how we'd like to change. And I understand that desire to be different. Who in this room doesn't want to be more patient, more giving, more loving, more kind, less judgmental, less prone to ego or anger, or at least happier. But I also know how easy it is to confuse our ability to live more fully with our ability to create a perfect, finished life for ourselves. I know how much pain comes in my own life when I confuse the two. The vision we get on television and media of the perfect, tidy life that we could almost purchase out of a catalog seems to be that carrot hanging on a stick in front of us like in the cartoons. Something that drags us along and takes all of our attention but we just can never reach. Now whether or not you're in Rue's situation, waiting for Ned to leave so you can really live, or whether it's just as simple as believing that I'm really going to live my life once this project or semester is over, once things at work settle down. I know I found myself saying that. I'll be a better husband when this rough month at work is over. I'll have time to have a spiritual practice and a deep spiritual life next year, maybe. Whether it's the end of a project or even something as substantial as a major change of heart, I think it's so tempting for us to believe that life Real life is just on the other side of the next resolution. And how easy it is to find ourselves 
frustrated and bitter when we get to the other side and find that we are still incomplete, still unfinished, still in process, and still oh so human. Now the call to wake up to this moment, to be alive to the life that we currently have is nothing new. It's not a spiritual challenge I've invented. But I think the fact that it's been around for so long points to how hard it is. I think of the student in the story that Scotty read to us and how often those of us in the room have been like that person. Where will I find my happiness? The disciple asks, and the teacher says, enlightenment's happening right now if you look. But I look all the time, says the student. And the teacher wisely responds, no, you don't. To look, you have to be here. And you're pretty much somewhere else. I spend a lot of time somewhere else, having a loving family, a job that fulfills me, countless other divine things in my life that are right in front of my face, and yet I'm thinking about the thousand things I could have said differently or not said at all that have happened in the past week, or living in that future fantasy where I look like the photos I see at the gym, or my life is tidy and organized, and I am the person I always said I would be. Here we are, these finite human beings. We're changing all the time, and yet it's so easy to convince ourselves that if we work hard enough, we'll have that tidy, packaged, perfect life. But just after one more change. Now, I knew that we would have some children and people of all ages in the service today, and it reminded me of how easy it is for people of all ages to feel like our best life was either just behind us or somewhere around the corner. I remember when I was a child hearing adults tell me that once I grew up I would understand some things or that I would be able to do things when I got older and just how frustrating that was. I remember always thinking that I would really be a person just after I became a teenager. Teenagers are real people. Or just after I got a driver's license or just after I was able to vote or go to college or a thousand things and I thought I would stop feeling that way. And then what I didn't realize as a child is that adults feel that way too. So many of us spend our days feeling like we're just almost where we want to be. I even have heard older members of our congregation here tell me that the messages of our church are good and healthy ones, but they're really more suited for younger people who can still act on them. Think of how prone we are of any age to believe that it's not us that the message speaks to, that it's not my life as it currently is, it's somewhere back there or somewhere ahead. In her reading that we read this morning, Kathleen Norris talked about how dangerous that notion of a tidy, perfect life can be, and just how much it seems to seep into all of our American life right now. I love that image she had of the Benedictine monks living together, trying to make themselves polished and better, saying that you could indeed do it, but like a rock tumbler, you had to bounce up against your imperfections and other people's until you came out nice and polished. Kathleen Norris is a Christian, and she says that real life and real growth and real maturity is messy. Her tradition of Christianity posits that even God had to enter the world in messy human life. To grow up as a child, to make friends and lose them, to sing and cry and suffer and even die. The kind of perfect, tidy life that Kathleen Norris says we're so often striving for and believing is just around the corner isn't just frustrating, it's impossible, right? And when we believe that we can craft that life, we are, as we say in this church, out of harmony with the divine. Now, we don't have any final word in this church for what God looks like, but in my experience, the holy is a transformative, emergent, dynamic process that brings to life things that were not there before. And what I know from science and my teachers is that the universe doesn't create finished products. Everything is used and used again, stars exploding and their atoms becoming the matter of our bones, our bodies going back into the earth, that nothing is as it will always be. Just think of how many billions of mistakes it took for us to exist. How many departures 
from the genetic code, how many mutations and unplanned moments had to take place for you and I to be alive at all in this room. And yet here we go, believing that this year I'll have a finished life, chasing after perfection that doesn't even exist in the universe. Now the Buddhists tell us that everything is impermanent that all is changing, and that so much of our suffering comes from the idea that we could hold on to something so tightly, something that would never change. Buddhist teaching suggests that our peace and happiness comes from being as attentive and mindful to the present moment before us as we can be. And I love what they call the part of our self that keeps us from doing that. They call it monkey mind. It's like a monkey bouncing from limb to limb, never staying in one place. And in scientific terms, we get that in the neo-mammalian part of our brain. It's good to have it. It helps us make plans. It helped our ancestors decide which animals were dangerous and which tree branches to jump out of the way of. But it makes it very hard to stay in the present moment. The very thing that allows us to live is the very thing that makes it hard to stop Look at our lives and see that we're where we're supposed to be. I was reading the ancient Hebrew scriptures this week, and I was amazed to see that they knew something about an unfinished life. The people who wrote the book of Genesis set it out in, in poetry, in verses. In that first book, they write having their God stop at each stage of creation and say, it's good. Right out of chaos. Right out of a swirling void, each section of the creation not finished, messy, imperfect, so much to go. And these poets believed that their God would stop and look at that and say, it's good. These religious traditions imagine that God's most transformative moment might be coming to earth as a frail human being or perhaps stopping to live in the present moment. Some posit that even their God looked out over a messy, incomplete world and said it was good. Yet how hard is it for us to do that? How hard is it for us to look at our incomplete, messy lives and say that? I wonder if today after the service we all found the nearest mirror and looked into it and saw the reflection staring back at us if we would be able to say the same. It is good. I hope so. So on this January 1st of 2012, my question for you as we enter the new year is, how are you going to respond to being in process? To the fact that you'll always be unfinished? With bitterness or gratitude? In awe or frustration? If we turn the golden rule around for a moment, would you be able to treat yourself with the same types of being that you hope other people would treat you with? I love that charge of the Benedictine monks where they said that the idea is to treat others as guests in your home with the same attentiveness you would when you were alone, and perhaps the harder task of treating yourself with the same care you would a guest. So as we enter into the new year as unfinished people, I'm choosing two lights to guide my way this year. Vision and compassion. Vision means knowing that it's bigger than my resolution. That my salvation or utter failure as a human being doesn't come from losing those 10 pounds or finishing my reading list. It's the idea of our thematic year here in the church. When we talk about this year being a conversation about moving forward in our lives, that we know that everyone here came here looking for something. We didn't use Google, we used this place, like a giant search engine. But that we didn't come here looking to lose 10 pounds or finish our reading list, that it's something bigger than that. So vision asks us to ask why we want those changes in our lives. It asks what kind of life we're trying to build by doing those things. And it recognizes that the life we can build is so much bigger than our imperfections. And compassion, I think, means 
remembering on a daily basis just how hard it is to be a human being. Just how hard it can be to know that we're limited and be able to imagine a world beyond what we can do. How hard it is to be a human being that knows deep down inside that we all deserve love and affection just as we are, and yet we know that we can do better all at the same time. I think compassion means remembering that the people that we meet in our lives, they're carrying around just as much of that burden as we are. That the people in our lives, young and old, they're trying the best they can to grow and change. And that most of us do it imperfectly. I think compassion means trying to grow a set of holy eyes. The kind of eyes that people have attributed to sages and even gods. The kind that look out over unfinished lives and say, it is good. And perhaps the hardest task of all to use those eyes to see ourselves this year. So let us make resolutions. Let us reflect this year on how we can and must grow. But my friends, I hope that in the midst of all the hurry and anxiety and all the promised perfection that we will most certainly be given, you will remember that it's all unfinished. The universe, the earth, our bodies, your goals, perhaps even God's, that it's all growing, changing, imperfect and beautiful. May you have the eyes to look at yourself this year, unfinished, and say, it is good. Many blessings upon you this day, my friends, and all year. Amen.